Betcha. You said on the telephone you were undecided. I didn't think I was hurting anyone. You have lost your mind! If you don't want to talk about what happened, that's fine. But you can, you know. You're distracted. You take it, break it, share it, and let No one made you sleep with him. Best babysitter in the world. I don't think about it at all. I think we made a difference, and it was the adventure of a lifetime. Do you want to know what this means or not? All I'm saying is he may not be coming back. He's done it before. Welcome to Mad Men Men, the weekly show where we discuss a show that used to come out weekly. Each week, we take a close look at an episode of the AMC series Mad Men, which ran from 2007 until 2015. We gear our conversation around the conversation the show is having about gender, the patriarchy, and making our own ice cream in Vermont, which is a pain in the ass. Speaking of which, I'm John Negroni, and uh, I, I don't know what to say. Well, I'm making good podcasts, if that's... I, I, I know you're owed more than a podcast. Hey, welcome back. Here's what else I got. Uh, okay. I ruined everything. My family, my wife, our podcast. That one's pretty good. Um, uh, this I'm just going to skip this one, because I know you're not going to like it. Um, oh, yeah, okay, so... You know, Will, we've been thinking about things over here. We're we're gonna have to put Mad Men Men up for review. Uh, I mean, that's probably accurate given the this rambunctious season that we've had uh, covering season two of the show. Look, Will, every podcaster knows that if his co-host's unhappy, his podcast suffers. Yeah, that one's actually pretty good. You know, I was in love with this podcast when we started it, and then you stuck your microphone in, put these ideas in our listeners' minds, and made them unhappy. That one's less good, but uh, I can I can appreciate the effort that went into it. Uh, all right, I, I, I know I got I got one more. Okay. Well, now that you're a big Mad Men fan, I'm gonna tell you something. Your co-host Mike and I are having a disagreement, and he went away to make another podcast. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, I mean, I could see that. Mike has been missing, so he has been kind of vicariously. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, well, so I thought it was kind of fitting. Right, right? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, he's not here this week uh, for more tragic reasons that we don't need to get into. But um, yeah, I mean, I hope he can come back uh, maybe next week. Maybe, uh, maybe, I don't know. Maybe. Now, OK, we're talking about Mad Men Season 2, Episode 12, the penultimate episode, The Mountain King. This one was directed by Alan Taylor. Uh, this is Alan Taylor's third uh, directing, uh, third time directing a Mad Men episode. Uh, first time, I be- or sorry, fourth time directing a Mad Men episode. Fourth. Uh, he directed three episodes last season. Um, and he also did the penultimate episode last season, Nixon versus Kennedy. And uh, Matthew Weiner and Robin Weiss, uh wrote the episode. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just always funny to me when, because I think he does good work on this show, but in the back of my mind, I'm always just thinking like, all right, another episode in the books. Now I got to get my focus back on Thor, the Dark World. You right. know, and, I mean, was he doing that when he was doing uh, episodes of The Sopranos? Uh, no. Uh, wait, did he do episodes of The Sopranos? Alan Taylor? Did he? I don't Absolutely, know. right? Which and ones did he Game do? Game of Thrones? Well, he did Game of Thrones, yeah, but which episodes of The Sopranos did he do? Uh, let me look it up. He directed a bu- he directed two episodes in... Uh, wait, no. Sorry, I mean, oh, oh, wait, me. oh, yeah, of course he did, because he did um, May Saints in Newark. Of course he directed episodes of Sopranos. What am I thinking? It's early for me. It's early for you. I found it. Okay. He directed nine episodes of The Sopranos. Uh, one from season one, and then another from season four, one from season five, and then he directed a bunch of episodes... In season six, including the Blue Comet. Yeah, no, you you're correct. I'm uh, I'm still waking up, so I I don't know why I forgot that because yeah, because David Chase was supposed to direct May Saints in New York for some reason he couldn't do it. He's like, well, who do I got in my Rolodex that can do it? Alan Taylor. Well, he's you know making all these blockbusters. I guess we should hire him to make this dang blockbuster movie, and you know the rest is history. Now this was <laughs> uh, we have a dip in the ratings. From last week's The Jet Set, but it's still one of the highest rated uh, episodes of the season. Um, you know, kind of in the middle, actually. And this was a bit of a controversial episode when it came out. I was looking up reviews from when this aired in October 2008. And yeah, there there were some like, you know, fans of the show, critics who really like were, were really liking Mad Men at, at this point, who found The Mountain King to be kind of disappointing. And I, I'm a, kind of in a, the it's fine, you know camp for this episode i think it's like a kind of solid b 
of an episode of Mad Men. And I guess I'll get into why. But uh, Will, do you share in this or are you kind of like, what are you talking about? This is uh, peak fiction. I mean, I haven't seen next week's episode, obviously, but it feels like this is sort of like the middle chapter in like a like, you know, little trilogy of episodes that are going on here. And it kind of reminds me, it's funny that we're talking about Sopranos, because it kind of reminds me a little bit of the Kevin Federney episodes where, you know, uh, at the beginning of um, season six of Sopranos, you know, where he's, you know, uh, without giving anything away in that show, like kind of, you know, disassociated from everyone else and kind of living, um, you know, vicariously in a different identity, a different life. Um, obviously, that's more like a dreamscape, whereas this one kind of feels like he's in a waking dream, but it's like not a dream. But then there will be several scenes where I'm seeing Don I'm have like, is this a memory? Is this a present? Is this something he's just imagining right now? It's very sort of at first a little frustrating, but then kind of fascinating to watch his uh, segments of the show. But then I, I don't know if the episode itself has as much structure as the last one did, or even other episodes this season. But then I feel like that's sort of purposeful because without Don, the office, there is this kind of sense that everyone is also, also sort of adrift because Don isn't really figuring himself out at the moment. So everyone's kind of in their own, you know, weird little place right now and not really sure of where to go and what to do. And so it makes for an interesting episode. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to bounce right off of that. And yeah, there is something that Anna says to Don, you know, when they're doing the tarot card reading. And she says that the essentially that she's like, you're everything. You're like ev- everything. Every living thing is connected to you. And I took this as like Don being the main character of the show, you know, and like how like all of these like branching stories from the other characters kind of have him at the center of it. Yeah. Um, well, if you're yeah. if you're Dick Whitman, you might be happier, but we don't have a show. So just think about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Matthew Weiner has said himself that he believes, the, you know, thematically, this episode is about the past and living with your choices and your ability to change. And he's, he's talked about in the, the commentaries that a lot of this episode is about how California is on the rise and New York is on the decline. Um, in his mind, New York like really peaked around 1960. And I, I kind of not sure. I, I really agree with that because like the California episodes, I don't take that it's on the rise. I take that. It's like, it's like an example of like the fifties, like it's stuck in the past. Um, because that's so much of like how nostalgic and retro a lot of the scenes are. And like, it's not really Don. We're interacting with Dick Whitman, right? Or I guess it's more about like who he would have been if he had stayed, you know, in California and uh, not become Don Draper, which by the way, Will Ashton, Anna Draper. You got to meet Anna. You a fan? Yeah, she seems lovely. I mean, I, yeah, I guess uh, that answers a question from the first episode of the season as far as who he gave the book to. And who he wrote the letter to, but also the answer is a question. Remember uh, when you guessed and you were totally wrong? And you, you yeah. Know. Well, I mean, how was I supposed to guess this? <laughs> Wasn't you the weren't, character? but we yeah. set you up to fail. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it also but you did question. get it right. You did get it right when you said last week, like I asked you, oh, who is he calling up on the phone? And you're like, oh, maybe it's that blonde gal, the one from the, the car dealership in the 50s. Huh? That's what, how you said it. You're was kidding. that Anna in that episode? That was Anna, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Interesting. The one who like cornered him at the the dealership. Huh. You're not Don Draper. I that's I, what she said. Yeah, but I don't know if we were introduced to her name in that episode. But I mean, I do. We were not. Yeah, yeah. But you, we see what she looks like, and then in this episode, we see the aftermath of that incident, like that he takes her back to the apartment and is just like, "I have this, I have that." Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How so, about that? A thing like that. Uh, so we have a bunch of different beats. In this episode, different story arcs, we've already touched, of course, on Don being in California and having some scenes with uh, Anna. I was going to I'll say, you know, I don't love this episode, but I think some of the best parts of this episode have to do with Dick, you know, really just talking and sharing things. And the, the conversation they have on that porch is like one of the best scenes in the entire season. Uh, I think it's really, really terrific stuff. Uh, but the rest of the episode, we, we have a lot of other things going on. We have Joan and Dr. Greg. Uh, really just, that is just a rough, no matter when, yeah. you know, in context, you're talking about this show, even for 2008, man. Yeah, uh, a tough scene. Tough scene. 
Yeah, I, I listened to some of the commentaries of Christina Hendricks, uh, the actress who plays Joan, talking about what it was like to make that scene happen and how she was sort of like, yeah, you know, they, they did a lot of things to try to make sure I, I was okay and checking on me and everything. And yeah, but still, still. Um, there's also Pete putting his foot down with Trudy and uh, it all kind of blowing up in his face. Uh, it looks like Trudy would kind of was doing the adoption thing around his back. Yeah. Which, you know, it's interesting because like a couple episodes, he was kind of like in the episode, The Inheritance, he was kind of warming to the idea, right? Of like, OK, maybe adoption, you know, people do do that. His brother seemed lightly encouraging. He kind of like stands up for it to his mother, who's kind of like pulling from the discards, like she's a Harry Potter villain or something. Uh, but in this episode, he's just like, no, we're not doing it. That's final. So what, what was your take on that? Like, do you think it's because he's given it more thought? Do you think it's because she did it behind his back? The show is kind of a little bit vague about this, at least up to this point. I mean, there What's is a sense that he often feels emasculated and that, you know, he doesn't really feel as confident as the other people at work or at home because he feels like he's, you know, inferior. So I I think there is maybe some truth to, uh, you know, the fact that she did behind his back, the fact that wouldn't, you know, be his biological child. So he feels like he's like, you know, like basically a foster system as opposed to like an actual man. But then there's also that conversation he has um, with his secretary where she like seems like, kind of take pity on him or like even like really warm up to him because he's going to adopt the child. And I don't know if that, or you think he, you, he takes it as pity because it's not pity like in a literal sense. I don't sense, know. Right? I mean, that's the thing, right? He's like, yeah, I mean, she's not pity. She's like, it's like the only time, uh, Hildy seems to like Pete is when, yeah, she's, you know, famously been super cold to him, kind of like giving him the business. And she's like, yeah, if it's not pity, it's more of sort of like she's kind of babying him or sort of like, well, that's what I mean. Talking to him like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It just seems like he feels like emasculated and that he needs to like stand his ground for a reason. Then I guess that means throwing a a dang turkey out the the window or the. Yeah, this is uh, and I'll I'll bring this up. uh, It's part of trivia. Uh, but that's based on a, a story of a guy named David Isaacson. I figured it um, was to Matthew Weiner. I was just about to yeah, ask. Yeah, it was like a real thing. <laughs> was that an incident that happened? I, I love those videos too. Like I, there have been a bunch of them where they they take that scene of where Pete picks up the chicken and throws it out the window, and then it falls on somebody in like a video. Oh, uh, okay. Um, um, I mean, it was another situation where similar to uh, the TV in the first season. I feel like they should have had some fun yeah. sound effects that they, you know, like. <laughs> yeah. I'm walking. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> My leg. Like a cat. <laughs> yeah, the cat is always a classic. <laughs> yeah. A puma for some reason. Um, like a, a bunch of bowling pins falling down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, the Pete stuff uh, also goes to a head when, of course, Trudy tattletales um, because they have their big blow up. Of course, she's like, you have lost your mind. Uh, wonderful Allison Brie in, in full swing here. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. What's his name? Uh, her father, Mr. Vogel. Uh, mm-hmm. Tom? Yeah, Tom Vogel. Sure. He calls up Pete um, while Pete is on the phone, I think, with like I maybe practicing for a conversation he's going to have with IBM because he just kind of like puts the phone down after that. It's like some kind of weird device. I wasn't sure what that was about. You don't remember this? I mean, I remember. I don't, I don't have an answer for you, <laughs> so I don't know what to say. I've always wondered. I'm like, is he just like – practicing a phone call what does he do okay i don't know i mean it kind of does add to the idea of like you know he's like fathering pete and again if he is feeling sort of emasculated and uh you know and i'm talking about before he gets on the phone with oh okay yeah yeah yeah. i think i know what you're talking he's like talking into this like little device and i don't know what it is oh okay i I was like oh is he like practicing being human I mean, that's what um, I always assume is that like he's just like an alien <laughs> walking in human form and he's yeah, I, trying to take donations I mean, back. And- I, I thought it was like maybe he's like, you know, because everyone in the office like has like this inclination to like write a book or like write something. And I feel like maybe he was like trying because he still fancies himself to be like a writer. I was wondering if he was like, yeah, try- he's like chat GP, chat, chat GP. There sure. Um, I was wondering if maybe he was like trying to like prematurely write his memoirs in that moment like you know like trying to like fancy himself like this like high and mighty businessman like here's what you need to know to make it in advertising in new york city 
Hmm. Uh, I'm going to say no to that, but uh, okay. Sure. Is it more outlandish than my thought that um, Duck was ha- fancying his lawyer from last week? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a similar similar energy, sure. Uh, okay, so uh, another big story beat of this episode is the Putnam, Powell, and Lowell merger is still in the process. There has to be a meeting of the partners. Uh, Bert Cooper is a bit sort of hesitant about doing this. Uh, we get to meet Alice Cooper which uh, that's, you know that's just the writers having some fun. Yeah. Um, Never tell you I met Alice Cooper? Um, I think you did, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. And uh, yeah, I, I uh, also Robert Morse did uh, some of the commentaries for this episode too. And, you know, he kind of mentioned that like the joke went over some people's heads, like the Alice Cooper thing. And uh, yeah, I mean, Robert Morse, by the way, is just so lovely. Just such a, such a wonderful man. Um, and then Peggy... She doesn't have Don around. She doesn't have her mentor. Uh, so she has to try to land the Popsicles account on her own. And very interesting part of the episode. And then there's this whole thing where Pete, or not Pete, uh, Betty uh, ca- catches Sally smoking. And, uh, you know, she has a rebel rebel preteen on her hands. I mean, I guess she's only eight, so she's not even a preteen yet. Well, I mean, is it really rebellious? I think she just kind of like sees both her parents smoking all the time like a dang chimney. So she's just kind of well, she like, knows it's wrong. Well, sure. But I mean, I think she like, I don't know, just kind of wants to know what it's all about. She's rebelling yeah. against the rule. Well, I think she's acting out. Sure. But her um, uh, because her smoking ethic is terrible. Like it's like she's never <laughs> smoked a cigarette before. She should know from her parents that, you know, you put it in between your fingers, not like hold it like this, like it's a dang joint or something. Like it was just it was amateur hour, I thought. Wow. I, I, I didn't realize you were going to uh, really go so far. Uh, on Betty's uh, smoking. I'm skills, just saying, if okay. she's gonna smoke behind her mom's back, she better do it right. You know, she should. And again, she's eight. I know, eight years old. Yeah, yeah. You know, like back in the day, like parents would be like, "Oh, you're gonna like smoke a cigarette." Well, guess what? You're gonna smoke this whole pack if you want to be, you know, Mister Smoker. Isn't that like an old like punishment technique? I could see Betty doing that, which would be horrible. I'm saying, but maybe it would teach her how to smoke a cigarette. I'm just going to try to keep you talking so you can continue to, to say things up. you're going to regret. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm looking at all these stories, you know, some I like more than others, uh, certain, you know, the, the, it doesn't all cohere that cleanly. I don't think I, I've been racking my brain about it. I mean, the best that I could come up with is that it's an episode sort of about what men do when their ego gets wounded. And how they kind of like escape uh, to other, you know, to some like reckless behaviors. So Pete, of course, does that. Uh, It's it's almost like this episode is like, yeah, men, men are too emotional. Right. Uh, So it's kind of subverting that that trope, that uh, horrible thing to say, like, oh, women, women can't be in charge. They're too emotional. And this is the episode where the men are super emotional and acting out and messing up while the women sort of take charge. Uh, Betty taking charge of the household with mm-hmm. uh, parenting Sally, even in what uh, is like forging a signature. In that one scene, yeah, the, it's like the first scene with her is like she has sort of like taken over while in Don's absence, kind of showing that she doesn't need him, uh, not really. If you kind of uh, really gave her the chance to shine, right? And then uh, also Peggy, who lands the popsicle account and is like calm and soothing while you know ken cosgrove is kind of like well i don't know about this uh, popsicles how are we going to sell these popsicles and sal is just like hey hey let peggy cook mm-hmm. and uh that's exactly word for word yeah how good very uh very fitting dialogue for the time very time accurate for sal. um but yeah i mean <laughs> they even kind of highlight that with uh, the conversation she has with roger where he's just like you're the only one in this office that has the balls to even ask you know like exactly yeah yeah and it's Alice Cooper who seems to be the more level-headed about this merger. Um, you know that obviously, like she's level-headed about like Roger sort of like only really doing this, you know, because he's like losing money from his divorce, and kind of seeing that Bert Cooper is not being decisive, and he's kind of trying to like hold on to his legacy for like. I guess maybe to her, maybe selfish reasons. What, what was your read on Alice Cooper, though? Yeah, I mean, Bert's just kind of trying to and ran it uh, as usual. But yeah, it's not really going to cut it. Uh, 
with old Alex. She's able, she just like talks him around circles, you know? Yeah. Like, it, it's the first time we've seen Burt Cooper kind of put in his place a bit. Right. And yeah, like when they're um, having the, the boardroom meeting uh, and like he looks over to her, like even though he clearly doesn't want to, like it's like a kid looking at his mom mm-hmm. being, you know, like, you know, being forced to apologize or something. It's just, yeah, it is. And it's uh, his younger sister. Yeah. So. Uh, I think part of it too is that she has like those little foxes on her yeah. <laughs> neck, and like even Rogers a little bit of like, sorry, I don't know who to look at. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but then she, oh, oh, she gets him back right after that. Sure. Where she's just like, we, you have the the children to think of, and he's like, oh, I just have just the one. Really? Yeah. Oof. Well, then before that, they even mentioned that like, um, she Roger, was his yeah, Roger. Uh, was babysat by her so that's another way that like you know she was kind of taking charge of uh, a man in this case you know like cheesy how much you want to bet he tried to sleep with her uh, uh, you think I'm saying things that I'll regret on this show uh, what I mean come on when he was being babysat he probably was like can you imagine Roger as like a kid not really no I I, I, I see him coming out of the womb as a 45 year old man <laughs> in a suit yeah in a martini <laughs> in the white glass. hair already yeah. <laughs> martini glass <laughs> uh, i have a reservation yeah. uh, at lutes for some oysters <laughs> this was lovely mother Dude, but i gotta go <laughs> to the charlton at five i'll see you for 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 uh evening supper or i don't know I don't, yep. yeah i don't know why he has two dinners in the scenario but but he's like looking at her chest yeah yeah, yeah. what a pervert let's move off of that uh, <laughs> uh so this episode is called the mountain king and we, it's it's pretty direct about where that's coming from. It's uh, the song in the Hall of the Mountain King that the kid is playing on the piano, um, which uh, an interesting bit of trivia too. Uh, early trivia is that originally the, Weiner was going to have them play that song in the background of the phone call that Sarah Beth Carson is having with Betty, and so they changed it up and they put it in this scene. I think because it, it's a little bit more direct, I guess about the the meaning and significance. Are you aware of what the what play uh in the mountain in the Hall of Mountain King is from? You might need to remind me. Pier Gint or Pier Gint, G Y N T. Okay. It's a, a Norwegian five act play um from the 19th century, late 19th century, and it's kind of about um, a man who like leaves his family and uh, he's kind of like avoiding his problems, uh, procrastinating his life. Uh, can, can you uh, can you imagine um, what uh, what they're getting at with that? I might harbor a guess. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, I mean, having it be diegetic to that one scene, I think makes more sense and having it placed in that phone call. I think it just would have been more distracting than anything. Yeah. But then you also get this really nice bit of dialogue. Uh, where he talks to the kid, you know, and he's like, it's scary, you know, and the kid is like, I know. And it, I, I do think that it's got a cool little moment, you know, a little bit of like a uh, a piece of writing that is kind of interesting in an episode where a lot of things are just kind of said out loud and very directly. Um, it comes even down to like when Peggy gives her popsicle pitch, they're like, I love popsicles. And like, it's just it's like a simple episode or simpler than we usually get with Mad Men. I mean, another example, too, where Sal was talking about um you know, like as a kid, his mom would separate the popsicles and give them to the two kids like she was, you know, parenting uh, Sal at that moment and, you know, kind of being in charge. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Also, I like that. Oh, I mean, she says like her mom did it, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, also, that's just like the fact that mothers are kind of uh, at the forefront of uh, this episode. But also, I was going to say in that scene, they talk about, uh, you know, they, they compare it to like, you know, The Last Supper and all that stuff. And I thought that was fun because. We're watching and discussing this episode on uh, Easter weekend. So I was like, yeah, that's what well, you're, you're saying. What what part you thought was like the Last Supper? No, like he, he compares it to the la- or Ken, I think, compares it to the Last Supper when they're talking about the popsicle thing. Oh, but like communion. But they, they end up going with a Virgin Mary, though, in the I, artwork. I know. I'm just saying that they reference the Last Supper and it's Easter weekend. And I thought that was neat. There, there's not a lot of deep thought here. I'm just saying that it's just neat that they they reference something related to Easter on while we're t- watching and talking about it on Easter. Will, you're shouting. <laughs> yeah. As Trudy would say to Pete. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. Um, okay. So on, on that note, actually, uh, the whole the whole deal between Don and Anna, 
Um, now that you mentioned kind of like mothers and, and things like that, what what do you think is going on there? Like how how would you characterize the relationship that they have? Because clearly there's no sort of like romantic stuff going on, but uh, you know, but what, what's your read on it? Do you connect it, for example, to the way that Roger is with uh, Alice Cooper, or is it very different? We're talking about Anne and uh, Don, right? Yeah, yeah. or really uh, Anna and Dick. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, more accurately. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I was saying before, I just feel it's interesting um, that like the, it feels like sort of out of place and out of time in many respects. Like Even to the fact where Don is constantly, uh, you know, reflecting back on their sort of relationship, but it also kind of just feels like a dream. You know, like it doesn't it's hard to, to parse what's real and what's not about it. And I don't know, it just seems like they're both very like loving but it's also it's maybe the most healthy romantic relationship that don has had so far as we've seen um but it's also like them like kind of assuming roles like it, it seems like they're both kind of like aware that it's not meant to be and like you know like even when don's talking about like i met this gal named betty and you know i think we're gonna make it in the big old new york city he's like so we're gonna have to get a divorce she's like oh yeah right like she's like forgot that they're like actually married or something or like i guess would that, be well, that's why i think like there's nothing it, it's nothing romantic whatsoever because it's just something that like not even crosses her mind or his mind yeah i don't i mean i think it is it isn't romantic like i think it's romanticized like the idea of it's romantic but i mean it's not romantic in like it's not like sexual set. yeah well i don't know i mean we don't know i mean there is like a love there i think and i mean you know i mean we don't see them there's a love but it's not sexual because, uh, you know, and Weiner has said this, like, directly. He said that uh, she is a mother figure to him. You know, she's the mother that he wishes he had had. And that's why, like, you know, he goes over and he sits right next to her on the bench. Right? You know, that's why he, like, confides in her in a way that he doesn't confide in other people. Because he just sees her as somebody who's not going, who's going to love him unconditionally. Right? But it's like... It's obvious it's not like the kind of love that like could ever lead to something else. It's, you know, quite honestly, I think for him, a like mother son dynamic, which is why I think we have the Virgin Mary stuff in this episode with the popsicle account. Yeah, I can get behind that. Yeah. And I also think it's interesting that uh, I meant to mention this before that she has the tarot cards and the Weiner Company logo is a tarot card as well. So I, I thought that was kind of a neat point of reference. Oh, yeah, I did see that uh, in a little bit of the, I think it was the IMDb trivia mentioned that. Because um, you see the Weiner Brothers logo after the credits of every episode, right. and then it's on the, yeah. I forget which card it is uh, Good point. Um, for the logo, but... Uh, uh, it was the Sun one, wasn't it? I think, I think so, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't love the tarot card scene, since you mentioned it. It's a little obvious, you think? like Yeah, and you know, it, it, so Weiner has said that he wrote that episode, like that scene... Um, before they like wrote this episode, they wrote it like while they were working on the first half of the season and you can kind of tell because it's, it's just so clunky and awkward. Um, Alan Taylor has said that, uh, he really didn't want to include this scene at all. Um, because he just thought that it was like so contrived, like the way that it goes down and, and down to like the dialogue, you know, I, I I'm okay. I think when she's sort of talking about like how he is like part of the earth and there's something a little bit more metaphysical and interesting about what that means. But then she kind of like gets into the whole, you know, Don's like people don't change. And, you know, it's like, okay, we're getting out more on the nose of like what the episode is about. Sure. But then, you know, he stop, she talks to him about like, uh, she says, the only thing keeping you from being happy is the belief you are alone. And on the one hand, I'm like, okay, I think that's the thesis of the show. I think that's what this show is. It's like what it's trying to say. But at the same time, did they have to just say it? <laughs> this is Mad Men. Usually, we don't have to go that far. Um, I don't. I, I I get what you're saying. I don't entirely disagree, but I feel like this whole show it, it did feel out of place to me because I feel like a lot of this show is characters kind of saying the same, and not like a bad way. Like, like characters kind of saying the same thing over and over again, and characters having to kind of learn that lesson belatedly. So, like, I don't. I, it didn't feel like that. Um you know, clunky to me compared to other scenes in the show. I guess by just within this episode, I think that's for some reason, the port scene kind of does the same thing, but I think it just does it better. 
I don't know what it is because like when he's sitting with her on the porch it's and he's like more graceful for sure in that scene. I think and, and it's it's less like thematic I not thematically. It's like less interesting in the sense of like they're not really doing anything. They're just sitting and talking. Usually like you want to include something, you want to include something that the characters have or are holding or are doing something to make the dialogue more interesting. But for some reason them just sitting on the porch it's just so like engaging what's going on between them that i don't need anything else to distract or like guide the conversation i guess that's why and i think part of the reason it's it's one of the best scenes of the, the season because you can just stand on its own or sit on its own huh yeah makes sense i think and uh, part of it too is like i think some people might complain like well it's kind of weird that don talks this much and i'm like well it's a dick I think that's why that scene is interesting. It's because we really are seeing yeah. like Dick kind of talking. Like it's almost just like he's, you know, been in the sunken place to borrow from get out. Sure, yeah. And Don Draper has been like driving the car and Dick finally is in control. Like he's finally like driving the body. Yeah. <laughs> and he's just sort of like, I'm watching my life, you know, and he, he like, he keeps trying to like dig at it, but like he's clearly like losing his mind, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like this is this has to be the first episode where there's like no Don. It's just Dick. Right. Like, I, I, I there's no like real moment in this where I'm thinking like, oh, that's him assuming the identity. Well, of I always fall back on the idea that he's both people. Sure. Um, but I mean, like, in this sense, it, it, he's, they're always kind of yeah. both there. Yeah, sure. That's fair. Um, but what I'm saying, though, is that, like, I feel like when I'm watching this episode, I'm mostly seeing Dick here. I'm not really seeing like the Don mostly, persona. Yeah. Like, is there any moment here where like don kind of takes over again i think there are times like when he uses his defense mechanisms he gets a little bit more sort of like oh i don't really want to get into that or like sure. you know I, I think you just see like the don sort of behind his eyes yeah right but like dick is always like in frame as well i don't know if it's always just only dick though that's that's where i kind of i don't know struggle i mean like like the one scene where like maybe he could have picked up the don persona and like a business sense, like when he sees those guys um, uh, fixing the car and stuff, I feel like that's just pure dick. Like, I mean, it's just, it is, yeah. yeah, which is fascinating. Yeah, it's like, you know, him actually having an interest in something like, you know, like being conversational in a genuine way, you know, not being like coy or like, you know, elusive or anything. It's just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a neat. Well, Weiner has said, uh, you know, what he likes about what he likes about this scene is that it, it kind of displays two things like one one thing about how don or dick is always he can just like fit in with like almost anybody you know you put him in a room with different people he's gonna sort of like connect to them or find a way and he said part of that is because dick whitman don draper they are fundamentally curious about everything it's like what makes him good at advertising it's what makes him good at like reading people it's what makes him as alice cooper would describe savvy is his curiosity and you see that in that scene where he looks at the cars and it's it's so different from how i think like dick whitman is the bigger car fan <laughs> clearly you know um but like as don like that was kind of his first real job was like you know coming from nothing it was selling cars and i think it's because he just has something for cars that you know dick whitman is just like a kid in a, in a tw candy shop you know what i mean where he sees those hot rods and like the the temptation to be like man i could i could make a life out here you know doing something fun um which i i actually had something else to say about that but uh go ahead no, i was gonna say i mean uh you did remind me that like with the alice cooper scene um she's like she's so uh curious to know like where don is and stuff in the sense that, like it kind of reminds me of sally in the way like even though don is so clearly younger than bert and roger to alice she feels like don is like the real adult here and like it's kind of like her like asking like where where's the like, the the adult in the room <laughs> you know like where's the other adult like where's the the dad or whatever yeah which i think she is, respects him yeah yeah which i think is fascinating absolutely and uh and it, it's interesting because that scene where i have the meeting of the partners and you know all of a sudden roger is just like Oh yeah, uh, you know Don is set to make you know like half a million dollars, and then jump cut to Dick Whitman with like the grocery bags. Like literally, he he has so much freedom in this world that he can just you know screw off over to California, yep, and like dick around. Sure, yeah, and, dick around, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it, and uh, in the process, like make 
a fortune, you know, half a million dollars back then. I mean, we're talking about like multi million dollars um, in today's money. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. yeah, effortless. I mean, you were talking before about like California in the show feeling kind of restrictive in the sense of like it's outdated. It feels through like Dick's eyes, like, you know, kind of indicative of like a, a time stuck in place and all this stuff. But indicative. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, but um, I do say like, yeah, like we have that boardroom scene where like the camera uh, is framed in that last shot with Bert like being boxed in that room. And, you know, he's just kind of closed in like he, he has no real control of the situation. And then we see, you know, Dick, like you're saying, like just out and about, fro- uh, you know, roaming about free as a bird and all that stuff. And I feel like that's like, even though it is kind of second place, like it, 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 the show is really good about establishing that Dawn can kind of just go anywhere and be anybody. And, you know, he can feel free, like he emotionally feels much freer, even if it is maybe restricted in the sense of uh, how much he can do in this place in this time. Maybe he already is a nomad, you know, like the people in the last episode and he just, you know, doesn't quite realize that he already kind of inhabits that role. Or maybe he did realize yeah, that. I and mean, that's why he was initially appealed to it. Right. I think we talked about that last week a bit where like, I think that's what's so appealing to him about that group is that like, even though he doesn't see himself as like a hippie, he does see himself as a bit of a nomad. Like he sees himself not really tethered to one place, one identity, one time. Okay. So when it comes to the Jones stuff, I struggle with this one a lot. Uh, just to even talk about it, Obviously, it's it's heavy and it's I really wish it wasn't in the episode. And uh, one of the things that I did find in you know, some of the behind the scenes with this episode is that, you know, there was like heavy debate, you know, in the writer's room about including the scene at all. And Weiner ultimately was the one who pushed for it because he said that at the time he would like read or when they were making the show, he would read magazines from the time, from the 60s, where women would talk about essentially like in so little words like what it was like to like not have consent right even in couples like married couples engaged couples how often um there would be date rape essentially and he wanted to include that as like sort of a you know just some kind i I think he wanted to use some sort of device with it something to really like bring the joan character to a different place and i think that it's supposed to be i think um, for her sort of realizing that like her marriage and everything, like as, as she is kind of looking like I'm getting married in Christmas and then Peggy, like, you know, kind of being like, that's wonderful. You know, in a it, look, you said Hildy was showing pity earlier in the episode. Like, I think Peggy is kind of doing it accidentally. And uh, cause like Peggy gets her office and Peggy, you know, we are one season away from Peggy sitting where Joan did, you know, in front of Draper's office. And, you know, a season later, two years later in the show's time, Peggy is now entering her own office right next to Don with her own secretary. And this was Joan's protege. Right. And like it's it's a moment that's crushing. And, you know, you you see that like Joan, obviously, like the really just like the truth about her marriage and this guy who is like she's trying to describe him on paper like a, he's a keeper as Peggy says, but he's actually a monster, like a horrific evil guy, a guy who is so like whose ego is so fragile and weak that the the second that Joan kind of like takes any kind of like sexual control over, you know, uh, at night by just getting on top of the guy, which is another sort of like, whoa, whoa, you know, how often did this happen in the 60s? And I think that's kind of what Weiner's getting at is like that would happen a lot. Um, when that happens, like he kind of like retaliates, you know, he retaliates in the in the worst way, in such a horrible way. And yeah, I, 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 I'm I very conflicted on this scene because like on the one hand, you know, there, there are things about it that I think are, you know, it is it accomplishing what it's setting out to do? I think in some ways kind of clumsily, like the whole thing with like leaving like the flowers on the desk. I'm just like okay like we get it like symbols but yeah i don't know obviously i'm 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 more negative toward it than not but what about you yeah i mean i'm not too sure um i do i mean it is a bold scene like it's it's a choice to make that i mean i can respect in the sense of like you know it, it is something that at that time like this is certainly before me too so it's a conversation that isn't as 
prevalent in uh, entertainment and in the broad conversation as it is now. Um, so it is it is a risky but bold choice to make creatively. Um, but it is also like, as far as we've seen with this character, which has been pretty limited at this time, we, we already established that he is not a great guy. Like we, we already know that he's dismissive. He's not really caring of Joan. Like, I don't know. Do we need this extra measure to really prove how much of a scum bag he is? Like, I mean, is it, do we need to take this measure? And that's the thing with the scenes like this involving uh, sexual assault is like, I mean, it's it's not a matter of should or shouldn't we, but like, is it purposeful to the story and to the character? And to me, I don't really know. I mean, obviously, I'm watching this show for the first time, so I'm I'm not as uh, uh, aware of what's to come. But yeah, I mean, it, it it in my initial reaction, at least, it did feel a bit um, a bit much, and and it doesn't fit as naturally into the the, the overarching narrative of the story. And I don't know if it accomplishes anything that hasn't already been accomplished with this character as far as just in in the sense that it's just like doubling down on that. So I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to say yes or no to it. I mean, it's not, I don't know. Maybe it's not for me even to say, so I'm I'm not sure. But yeah, it's something I was also conflicted on as well. Yeah. And and it's one of those things where I wish, you know, there, there are so many people who can't watch the show because, you know, there, there really is no warning. And this is the kind of thing that like, you know, for some people would be like really traumatic, you know, people who've gone through this sort of thing. And, you know, I wish there was a way to sort of, I don't know, get around it so people could obviously like enjoy other aspects of the show and, you know, not have to see it. It's just, it's just so graphic. You know, I think that's where it comes down to and could really like, I think harm some people watching it who don't know that it's coming. So yeah, it's, it's a struggle to, to recommend the show sometimes for that reason. And yeah, because there aren't, you know, this is 2008 when this came out. There are no content warnings There's nothing like that. So uh, hopefully things like that improve. You know, I know more shows are getting better about that sort of thing, like warning people ahead of time, you know, uh, especially like with other uh, things that are kind of of this nature. Uh, speaking of which, you know, like content warnings for suicide, th- there's the whole thing at the very end where, you know, Don is kind of like going through like a bit of a baptism in the water. He like takes his shirt off. And like on the one on the one hand, you can kind of say like, okay, you know, after the tarot card thing, it's kind of interesting. He's you know trying to connect with nature a little bit here. It's like he's you know trying to walk on water almost, and it's an interesting you know end to an episode where it's just like there's it's not really about like Christianity or paganism in terms of the tarot cards. It's sort of just about its religion, as you know, Peggy says. It's like it's 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 Christian. Right. And she talks more about how like religion forms into the identity. And that's, you know, for Peggy is like a very innovative concept. This idea of like using religion to uh, sell in advertising, um, understanding that you can do that without it being direct and taboo. Um, but then part of me wonders, like, is this really like kind of a it's kind of indicative of a suicide, isn't it? Of like somebody kind of like walking out of the water and not coming back. Like, I remember when I first watched this episode, I thought that's what it was getting at. And every time I rewatch it, I'm, I'm a little bit more conflicted. I'm like, is that really what they were going for on purpose? Or is this something you can kind of add to the text yourself? I mean, I don't know. I, I, considering that the scene before with uh, Dick slash John is about the tarot cards and the idea of like the resurrection, I kind of took it more and another sort of Easter thing to go forward. Um, it, I took it more as just like Don's kind of cleansing himself. And I, I, I did kind of have that thought as well, as far as like there is like a, a moment or two when the camera is pulling back and the waves go over Don slash Dick and we don't see him coming yeah. up of the water. And it's like, oh, geez, like is see, you know, you OK? Yeah, yeah. Don, you coming up? Um, but no, I mean, overall, though, I, I didn't really take it as like this was a suicide attempt. I took it more as like he's bathing himself in the water, like you said, a sort of baptismic scene that he's becoming a new potentially. Um, I hope so. I hope the next episode doesn't start with you're not going to believe what happened to Don. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, you would know better than me. So, you know, well, let's talk more about the, the popsicle account. I love this pitch. I love everything about it. It's one of the high spots in the episode for me because it's just it's simple. Right. And and how, you know, Peggy kind of like steps up. She knows that Don isn't around and she's calm. She's in control. She has to a lot is riding on this pitch. 
she has to land this account. I mean, because she's, it's sink or swim. I mean, the funny thing for me in watching this is that, like, I feel like Peggy is pres- assuming the identity of Don more than Don is at this point. Like in that meeting, she's just like definitely. There's more Don Draper from her in this episode than Dick Whitman. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, like, you're right. I, I just feel like in that moment, she's like the only one that's like taking on the Don role. Like even mirroring his cadence, like the way he speaks, the way he would pitch. The she's. Like, I disagree with that. Okay. I think she pitches her own way. I don't think she's acting like Don. I think the way she's she speaking is, is very Don like. Like and and not. Like, I disagree completely. Okay. I think her execution is different. I think she she understands like she's a woman and she kind of needs to talk a certain way. She's not being as direct as him. She's not being as like prickly. She's being and she's not even being like like she's being kind of similar in like her philosophical sort of world. But it's more soothing. I think she's talking to these guys like a mother. And it's a totally different thing that that what Don I mean, I I guess what I'm trying to say is that like I think it's her interpretation of Don. Like I think it's not like it's like she's just absolutely dawn but i feel like it's like what she gets out of dawn's pitches and like she's like okay what how would dawn like do this but like it's obviously a very peggy way because i think she's a lot more empathetic so that's uh, what but- i mean I, th- I think she's like taking aspects of his pitching style and making it her own you know like i really don't think it's like oh she's just kind of mimicking him Like, she's really just sort of like, I think that she's like studied this stuff a lot. She's watched him, but I think she understands that, like, because of her gender and because of her youth, too, like being so young, she kind of has to uh, really like use that, like, that weakness as an opportunity, you know, turn it into a strength. Yeah. I guess I just, which is that, you know, she's on, she's not as threatening. Right. I guess that's what I meant, though, is that, like, She's clearly taking the influence of Don, but yeah, she she puts her own little Peggy spin on it to be sure. Totally, yeah. She like puts them at ease, you know, and she doesn't crack under the pressure of it. They're they're sort of like, where's Don? And Ken is like, Don signed off on all of this. Like you kind of see Ken, he's about to like flip some papers in the air. He's freaking out. But meanwhile, like Peggy is just like, it's okay, Ken, you know. And she's like got her NPR voice a little bit. Um, I, I find Peggy's like pitching style to be very NPR. I don't know why, but she's just sort of like popsicles. We love popsicles. You take it, you break it, you share it, love it. And, and, and here's, here's what the best thing about this pitch will, because I think on the one hand, it's not very, the, the ad itself, I don't think is very good, um, at all actually, <laughs> but it's more sort of like the way she sells it is really good. She's essentially selling to these guys like, Hey, let's really reinforce this idea of like giving kids half the popsicle and you making less money (laughs) because like, they don't even think of that. I, I've always waited for them to like speak up and be like, won't this just kind of like show people that like they're going to, you know, a, a way to like use fewer popsicles and buy fewer popsicles. And like at that point, like Peggy, of course, could sell it, you know, just being a little bit more of like, oh, you know, that's why the ad will work. It's, you know, avant garde in that way and blah, blah, blah. But they don't, they don't even go there. They're just sort of like, oh, yeah, the word love. We like the word love, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. People love popsicles. I mean, that's what's funny about this scene, right? Is that like these guys are like, like they're selling a product that's, you know, frothy and like, you know, in the bright scheme of things, very frivolous, but they treat it like analytically. There is like, yes, yeah, we talk to our people and love is a word that people like to associate with popsicles. So we were looking people for- People do do that. Yeah. They split it in half. But yeah, they're that's like- a big revelation. Yeah, yeah. But I just think that's funny that like, they're like, all the people we've seen so far, like uh, the execs, they're like the coldest, most like- clinical people and they're selling popsicles that's true that it is a nice little little perk of the show uh but yeah uh peggy has a very successful series of scenes here she's on the the rise she's on the ascent you know what i mean she's just like new hairstyle she's got new confidence she uh you know she's she's got an office now she's got freddie rumson's drink card i mean peggy is making things happen right and so you love to see it. You love to see it. Um, is there anything else you wanted to to touch upon on this episode? It, it is tough because th- I think like we still have some stuff that the next episode, the season finale, is going to wrap up. But where, where are you at with this one? Um, 
Well, we didn't really get into like the Betty stuff too much. Uh, That's true. Yeah, I mean, you just—I think it's because you really like gave Sally Draper like <laughs> a real tongue lashing. Like, sure, yeah, she's Louise. I mean, I'm just saying, she's gonna smoke. She better smoke right. Okay. Uh, the Betty stuff. We had the Sarah Beth Carson phone call. You're right. We didn't. We didn't talk about that. Um, but I, I did kind of want to bring that up actually because, who, uh, Betty. Betty basically like, um, Betty has a phone call for Sarah Beth Carson and you can kind of tell that Betty is sort of like, Oh, uh, you know, I didn't make you do anything. Like she kind of, she gets like upset, right? Like Sarah Beth Carson thinks that she can kind of confide in Betty and also starts to be like, Oh, you kind of helped make this happen. Why do you think Betty gets so mad? Like, why do you think Betty kind of like starts to be like a jerk? And it's just like, no one made you sleep with him. It's like, how could you do that? Like getting so judgmental. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking about, it. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it is a sense of like her being on her own and like kind of feeling like, you know, like she's, you know, kind of forging her own path and then like kind of being resentful towards her friend for being, you know, like childlike. And she's kind of like, I don't know, like I, I in this episode, I kind of feel like she's kind of assuming the role that her mother had, like, even though she, Betty resents her mother a lot, like, it feels like this is the most we've, from what we've know of Betty's mom, like, this is the most she's like her mother, um, especially given that, like, you know, uh, she had such a kind of tough um, moment going back home with her dad and then, like, her her new stepmom or whatever. And so, I don't know, I, I think there is something kind of like that where she feels like she's, like, vicariously almost kind of, like, scolding herself in the form like of her friend and you know it uh, you can really see like if you were curious like oh what was betty's mom like um well how is betty with sally and i think that's our answer well, that's what i mean um, like I, that scene where yeah. she catches sally smoky i feel like i in that moment like i'm seeing betty kind of take on the role of her mother because like she has right. to be like strict but then like there's that scene or that moment shortly thereafter where she like puts her head on the the door and it's like betty coming back and it's like oh like what am i doing so it's, all, it's almost like betty hofstadt she she also has her own don draper dick whitman you know dueling personas one is her mother and one is uh you know yeah. the real betty the one who who made don happy you know he, he remember he was just like she's so happy and like she i love the way she laughs and sure she comes from a good family i'm gonna right. really get along with her dad <laughs> like, yeah 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 <laughs> Jeez Louise. Um, so you weren't surprised when Betty told Sarah Beth Carson to go fuck herself and when she's done fucking Arthur? Yeah, I mean, I don't think she was as coarse, but I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> there's a, well a bit. Uh, uh, there was a, uh, a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, a, um, you know, she has a history, I guess, of doing this sort of thing, kind of being rash. Sure. And yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I, I, I do think I do think part of it you haven't touched on. I do think it's partly jealousy, too. Right. Yeah. You know? It's like sort of like FOMO that Betty is having. It's just like, man, I could have slept with that guy. Right. And like, here I am not sleeping with him. Well, I was kind um, of alluding to that was, before, though. You like, got to get the sense that she was just like lusting after the dude and just didn't like, his, you know, mm, him otherwise. But true. like just kind of wanted that sort of like sexual gratification. Well, I think that's always sort of apparent with Betty. I mean, especially, you know, throughout the season, I feel like that she's been, you know, horny and sad. <laughs> um <laughs> jesus <laughs> uh like many people um but in any case uh i i will say though and i, I imagine you're gonna disagree with this but i think the scene with betty and sally where like they're talking on the couch rings a little flat for me that's interesting that's interesting because i was gonna ask you about that of like why do you think betty rewards sally it's like because on the one hand you kind of see like she gives sally the boots and it almost feels like she's like all right well i can't hang out with sarah beth carson at the stables anymore so i, I might as well bring my annoying kid uh, but why weiner has said this is this scene with her where she's confiding in sally and it's just like here's what's actually going on you're a big girl now you know and you can read into that you can say like oh maybe she's just trying to like soften sally with a gift before she kind of tells her the bad news that um her dad might have abandoned her um jesus uh but weiner said that this is like the first truly maternal moment we've seen of betty in the show the first time that she's really acting like a mother and not really like she's burdened by these kids but more so she's like showing an interest in you know helping sally you know grow yeah. up 
it's the first time she's not play acting as a mom, but rather actually being exactly. maternal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we, what's the issue you have with the scene specifically? I it's not even the execution. I just feel like acting wise, it just doesn't feel honest to me. Like it just feels very artificial. Are you? Are you after Sally? Dra- are you criticizing Sally Draper again, Kiernan no. Shipka? Watch out! I'm not. I Will mean, Will Ashen, your biggest critic? No, I mean, I don't know. I just like, like, I, I have applauded Janet Ray Jones throughout the show, and I think she's good otherwise in this episode. And I think, you know, likewise, Kieran Shipka is good. I just feel like, I don't, I don't just something about the scene. I don't know. Maybe it was just my mood. Whatever I watch, mm-hmm. it just didn't. It just didn't read as very sincere to me. It just felt kind of inauthentic. But it is fascinating that, like, in the sense of the show, like it's supposed to be the rare authentic moment. <laughs> I, well, I guess the thing that I like about it is sort of how like undramatic it is the way that Sally's just like, okay, like that did feel kind of like, yeah, that feels like a kid, um, like a kid just sort of being hit with like big news like this, but not really understanding it because she's a kid. She doesn't really understand the implications of like, I don't know where your dad is, <laughs> but her just sort of being like, Oh, yeah, he'll show up. I don't know. You say it's not dramatic, but it feels a little like, you know, uh, performative. I don't know. To me, at least. You think so? Yeah. I mean, I think Betty is trying, like, like really moderating like score her tone because she's talking like, to her kid. But people do that. Yeah. But no, I think it's like the score in the scene feels a little like it's like highlighting that it's a dramatic moment. And then, like, you know, Kieran Shipka just asking, like, you know, but where's daddy? I don't even remember the score playing during this part. Uh, I don't know. It just stood out to me. But I don't huh, know. Interesting. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to I'm not going to like, you know, I'm not saying this is like put this put this scene on like a, a poster board and <laughs> protest your offices. I don't sure, know. Yeah. I, I, don't, I thought like it's OK. It's not like a like horrendous. Scene. It's not like a disaster or anything. It just it didn't it just didn't really work for me for whatever reason. I wanted to bring up that uh, the thing that she says of like, you know, or like the, the disagreement Don has with Anna during the tarot card scene where he's sort of like why is this a good card? It's the end of the world. And she sort of is like, it's the resurrection. I think that's another sort of like, keep that in your mind. Like definitely like keep a lot of the stuff in this episode in your mind when it comes to like more stuff that happens in the series. Uh, because this is, this is, even though I don't love this episode, there is a lot of like set up here for like long-term payoffs. I'll put it that way. Other than that, I, I don't have too much else on this episode. I'm just glad that we got to hang out in California, you know, Outside, not just the internet, California for once. Sure, California. Eh? You know there is no before. Yeah. What's your trivia? I've got the trivia right here, and uh, I was just kind of like scanning my notes. Did we cover everything? I think so, um, except for some of the cadence of some of the lines. Uh, like the way Pete and Trudy fight, I think is just so interesting. Like there's so much like hidden there. Oh. You know where he's just like, don't do that. Like he knows that it's like a tactic yeah, when yeah. she is sort of like trying to deflect to like you're shouting. I did think the scene um, um, with Pete and uh, Peggy was pretty interesting in a sense of like, it's the first time they oh, yeah. really looked at each other as like colleagues and like with mutual respect. And like, it also kind of felt like a scene where it's like the two siblings kind of high in their room talking about their parents. Exactly. Oh, you know what? I literally wrote that like they have like a bit of a sibling dynamic here. And I think that that is really interesting considering like, obviously that's gross, but like it more sort of like step siblings, if anything else um maybe that's less gross or not still gross still gross but it's gross in a different way i'll put it that way but like yeah he it's not even that he respects her he does not respect her right like maybe he has a little bit of respect for her more than he has for other people that he has zero respect but it's just more sort of i think to me like he trusts her and it, it does feel like that's like a sibling dynamic that's like a sort of um we're in this together. Right. Uh, you know, I don't like you all the time, but you're here. And like, I know that if I, I can kind of like just be myself with you. But also like they're the youngest people in the office, basically, from what we can tell outside of Jane. Um, and the youngest people the high up in like, you know, but like, like respected positions. I don't know. Like, like when you're in a, a house and it's like she's much younger than him, though. She's like four years younger than him. Not much. Sure. Younger, but she's well, four years younger. Well, what so. I mean, though, is that um, like when like you're in like a house and it's like the parents, like the adults and the kids. Like there's like that's that understanding like we're kind of in this together, whether we agree or, or love each other or not. It's just like we're, you know, we're both the kids and they're the adults. So therefore we have something in common here. Like we kind of have to like, you know, be honest with ourselves and kind of like be real. I also think it's interesting. We're only one season removed. You know, it's been two years, but also, you know, 12 episodes or so since, you know, 
we had the fun Tom Vogel. The one who's just like, what are you kids going to have a, a kid, you know? Like, get busy, P. Campbell. And now he's just like, you listen here, you little shit. <laughs> like, if you don't give me a grandchild, <laughs> I'm going to ruin your life. Yeah. You have 90 what? days to turn it around. Yeah. I mean, God. Oof. What are you being used to, love? <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I meant, and you know it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All right, and yeah, another example of uh, you know Tom Vogel, another another man in this episode who gets too emotional about what's you know. All right, trivia time. So uh, most of Don's scenes were actually shot on location in San Pedro, which makes a lot of sense because they shoot the episodes in Pasadena, and uh, San Pedro isn't that far. But it's cool that they are on location. You kind of tell, uh, like really, like where they are in the episode is like very uh, very LA. Another piece of trivia it. is. <laughs> the uh the xerox that was on set it first of all it's like super hard to find xerox machines from that era that actually still work um mm-hmm. so what they did to make that happen like have the, the xerox machine at all is they they took the sound the machine made because they had access to that and then they incorporated it into the sound of the show super cool nice. um and pretty seamless but I guess you can kind of notice like when they're using the Xerox machine, they're not really doing anything with it, apparently. Um, so in the scenes where we see a much younger version of Don or Dick, uh, when he is at Christmas with Anna or when they're in his office, uh, they altered Don's voice to make him seem younger. And they also did some digital smoothing on him as well. You can kind of tell. I don't know if you noticed, oh, but I absolutely definitely... noticed the digital smoothing on his face. Cause I was okay. like, I was like, are they doing? Cause I thought that was like, not really. It's not bad for the time. Not bad for 2008. No, no, no. It, it actually looks pretty good for the time. But I was going to say, like, was that a thing yet? But then I was remembering, like, this would be around, like, 2010, right? 2009, maybe? This is 2008. Uh, 2000. No, wait, no. The first season's 2008, right? No, no, wait, that's 2007. First season's 2007. Okay. But I was, I've literally said 2008, like, 12 times. Right. But this would have been around, like, Tron Legacy, which is, like, the first time we saw that kind of thing prominently in a film. So it's like, okay. A couple so like, years before. Yeah, so, like, this technology yeah. was, like, in its infancy, but, like, still around. So, uh, yeah, I definitely noticed the digital touch-ups. But I was wondering if that was maybe, like, also the lighting just being, you know, softer, that they kind of... Well, they did do a lot. Yeah, I mean, they, they did a lot of, like, small things to really change the vibe so that it did feel like a different time. I think mean, that's, like, some people have been confused about the scene where Don goes over to the hot rods because, like... That also feels very like 1950s, mm-hmm. but that's supposed to be happening in the present. It's right. just, you know, when you change people's outfits and you change like the haircuts and, you know, the lighting, as you said, it really does sort of like aid that illusion. See, I didn't really even think of it at first as like, oh, this is a different time. I was thinking more like, is this like not even happening? Real? Yeah, because like because <laughs> Don has a digital smoothing and all that, it just kind of seemed like, oh, like, like, is he is he not real in this moment? Like, is this something that? Like he's only envisioning his head, and therefore it's like a false perception of himself. All right, uh, yeah. I already mentioned the whole Pete throwing the chicken out the window based on a true story. Um, and then uh, I also kind of mentioned this already, but like, yeah, Weiner has said specifically he never wanted there to be a hint of a sexual relationship between Don and Anna because, yeah, she's supposed to be the mom that he wishes he had. And then last, uh, Weiner has said that they heavily debated including the rape scene, but he felt strongly about including a scene about rape happening between two people who are engaged. Uh, Yeah, I already touched on this before about like the magazines and stuff like that. And uh, also already touched on the Weiner Brothers logo that you see on the on the tarot card. And that's it for trivia. Yeah, a little bit interesting considering there's a lot of stuff with like moms and sons as episode that we never see uh, Pete's mom. Well, we saw her just two episodes ago. I know, but like, yes, considering that's present in the episode a bunch. Peter's or, mom, or even Peggy's mom, has for that got matter. it going. But I don't think they they need to be in there. To be clear, that'll do it for this week's episode of Mad Men. Men, thank you so much for listening. We will be back next week. Hopefully, Mike will be back with us, and uh, we'll be talking about the season finale. We've already made it to the end of season two. How about that? A thing like We're marching that. forward to the halfway point. We're not that far from the halfway point of the series. Well. Are we really? Because once we start season three, once we're halfway through season three, we'll be halfway. Oh, man. It only took. How about that? A thing like that. Yeah, it only took forever. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say, it's like, it flew by. (laughs) Uh, But I'm very excited to talk about season three. For me, at least, it's going to be like, I think, smooth sailing through the rest of the series. But, uh, you know, 
that's uh, that's up for you to decide too. Well, uh, we'll see what you think. Uh, but next week's episode is meditations in an emergency, which will be episode thirteen of the season. Looking forward to that. But until then, we'll uh, be watching Mad Men. So see y'all later. See ya.